Well, we're here at the third session of the Paul Within Judaism Symposium, continuing our discussion on how Paul relates to the issues, institutions of ancient Judaism and what his proximity and practices are in relation to it. Today, we're honoured to have uh, a number of uh, presentations. Um, uh, in particular, we're going to hear from Professor Paula Fredrickson and uh, Professor Carl Wilhelm Niebuhr. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, uh, Paula, and uh, you can uh, uh, lead us on. I think the idea is to go for about 20 minutes speaking roughly, if you can, and then we'll open up for uh, questions. The first interlocutor um, will be your fellow panelist, um, Carl Wilhelm. So over to you, Paula. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I want to take... Um, a page from Josh's book and not read my paper, but uh, just sum up very quickly a few points uh, that I was trying to make because I'm much more interested to hear your reaction than I am to listen to myself um, summarize my own paper. I uh, also want to give a shout out to Mike for posting the first two meetings online because I was able to catch up a little bit, even though I wasn't able to be with you in real time. And I just want to give a shout out uh, to Ruben for his emphasis on the pluriformity of first century Judaism and uh, both Ryan and Ruben's observation, backed up nicely by Brian, that um, a translocal, uniform, authoritative synagogue, the synagogue, uh, is uh, didn't exist uh, in, in a way that clears anything up. I also want to thank Mark Nanos for uh, clarifying that uh, the distinction between the addressee of Paul's letters versus the social composition of the ecclesia that's listening um, to. I also think that uh, it's a mi it's a mixed group, and probably um, the the Jews in the group might have been the ones the poor, confused addressees turned to and said, "What's the part in the middle about Hagar and and Sarah again?" So uh, yes, definitely um, mixed groups. And finally, um, I really appreciated Jörg's emphasis on the fluidity and the constructed nature of ethnicity. I think what's interesting, what we see with Paul, what we see with the genealogies in, in Matthew and in Luke, what we see with the uh, intercity diplomacy of uh, Hellenistic and later uh, Roman uh, power brokers is that um, people are constructing genealogies but then they're acting as if the genealogies are essentialist. So it's it's a both and um, issue with uh, the way we're looking at, at ethnicity. And that's why I tried to, uh, in my own paper, use the Greek word for kinship group, uh, uh, rather than um, ethnicity, because ethnicity sounds so social science-y and that social science was not on. Uh, in the first uh, in the first century, um, finally, I just want to note that um, this idea of Paul's radical eschatology, an idea of an imminent uh, return of uh, uh, Christ as a triumphant uh, figure, came and went uh, in and out of focus, and maybe that will be something we might want to address when we have the general discussion uh, later. So, uh, finally, to summing up. Um, uh, summing up my points, now that we're all agreed and in harmony about what we mean by Paul within Judaism, uh, I thought I'd want to make my next pitch, which is Judaism within paganism. And let me start by saying that we deploy isms as our own heuristic device. There is no, I mean, I, I tease Steve Mason about this, but he's got a point. There is no Judaism. There is no paganism. There's, those are our big identity bins that we use, and we, we know what we're talking about when we do it, but that it implies a kind of um, stability of uh, ideology and identity that I think is, uh, again, Jörg's point with uh, the constructions of identity is it, something that's, in fact, um, actually uh, quite fluid. The emphasis I wanted to make in terms of the way heaven and earth are coordinated in antiquity was to emphasize the idea of family connections between gods and their humans. 
and uh, humans with each other in their respective uh, people groups. And that was, that was really the, uh, the point of part one of my paper. Point, uh, part two of my paper, Jews and everybody else, um, in terms of identity, what, what are we talking about when we talk about the ethne? And what do we think Paul's thinking about when he talks about the ethne? And also, here was the term that seemed to be most uh, elastic and problematized in the discussion. How does ethnicity relate to the idea of Israel and, and Paul's letters? Uh, how, do, how, do, how do Jews and how do ethne uh, map onto, um, onto that word? So in terms of Jews and everybody else, the point I wanted to make is uh, what we refer to in theology speak as uh, observing the law uh, is uh, Jewish paradoses, inherited custom, uh, really wasn't ever about salvation. And Jörg put this very nicely in his paper, I thought, when he said that for Paul, uh, circumcision is of no soteriological value. But my point is, uh, standing next to Jörg, is that uh, the observation, Jews doing Jewish things wasn't about soteriology. It was about Jews doing Jewish things, like Athenians doing Athenian things. And uh, so soteriology is something that comes into sharp focus because Paul's a member of the particular type of Jewish group he's a member of. But in terms of just Jews doing Jewish things, soteriology wasn't why, you know, those Jews who chose to stop uh, being on email on Shabbat chose to just do it, not so that they'd be saved. So... Okay, and also the other point about part two I wanted to emphasize is that Jews in antiquity did not live in a bell jar. Um, there was uh, mixed eating routinely in professional guilds. Um, I don't know what the kids who were in the ephibate in uh, Cyrene were doing, but they were, if they were exercising in the nude and um, uh, learning about gods and rhetoric, they were probably eating together uh, too. And in Antioch in particular, those nice Roman baths, um, people were bathing as well. So there's mixing that's going on, which is just part of being on the planet in the early uh, Roman Empire. I want to therefore also make the point that what we talk, speak of as God-fearers as, a, again, a heuristic category, it's, although it's also an ancient term, or what we speak of as Judaizers as a heuristic category, which was also an ancient term, is that it, it really, I looked at a few inscriptions uh, while I was thinking about this, and um, a woman named Tatian builds the oikos, um, in her community and the inscription thanking her for this, she's a pagan. Um, she's, an, she's not a Jewish person, but she builds a Jewish oikos. Um, she gets her own a front seat, a pro adria uh, in, uh, in the building itself. And um, Capitolina, another aristocratic uh, pagan, is it, it's not a two-tiered system. It depends on where what your social status is as a patron of the synagogue. Um, so just that, which is a fluid kind of um, thing as well. The third part of my paper on the law-free gospel, um, I, I wanted to emphasize that um, they're really the law free gospel is a kind of slogan uh, that we use in our classes. I've gone into print with it myself, but in terms of what Paul is asking of his ethne in Christ is is a form of Judaizing. If by Judaizing we use what the ancient term means, which is somebody who's not a Jew who's doing, starting to do some Jewish things. And the Jewish things that Paul is insisting that his uh, listeners do is uh, worship only the God of Israel. That's a very Jewish thing. Um, no idols and um, fulfilling the law. How much of the law? Well, not all of the law, but some of the law. So it's, and the law itself is, and and the God and the this, um, aversion to worshiping images of uh, deities are ethnically specific behaviors. So uh, even Paul, 
despite his rhetoric in Galatians, is teaching a kind of um, uh, teaching law of obedience in a sense. And obedience is in the right way. He's, he's Judaizing his, his Gentiles as well. Part uh, four on the end of the ages, I just simply wanted to um, uh, emphasize there that uh, one of the reasons Paul is confirmed in his conviction that he does live at the edge of the end of time is precisely because of his success in uh, imparting pneuma to uh, his Christ communities, uh, the ecclesia, and, and that's reinforcing uh, their status. And here's where Josh and I usually dance around with, what do we call these people? Are they, um, uh, are they Gentile Jews? That was uh, Josh's um, uh, experiment. My experiment was calling them eschatological Gentiles because they're not, the point is that they're ex-pagans, but they're not ethnically Jewish um, as well. So, um, and, Converts are a particular type of Jew, as again, Jörg uh, pointed out, their, their, um, their status is um, different from that of a born Jew and also different from somebody who's an active pagan. A God-fearer could be uh, an active pagan, and we have plenty of inscriptions about those people. Um, ancient people, when both classical authors and um, Jews, when they speak about what we talk about as con conversion, they don't speak about changing eth ethnicity or changing sungania. What they talk about is moving from one use, uh, one law to another type of law or to another type of polity. Uh, so they're using the language of political affiliation when they talk about uh, a radical kind of the a radical kind of Judaism to the point Judaizing to the point of of um, becoming an ex um, an ex pagan. So, what is the uh, status of these eschatological Gentiles? And here again, there's uh, in terms of how we designate these people. I think the main idea for Paul is that they join the family. That's why he calls them Adelphoi, and that's why he emphasizes adoption. So Gentiles join the family through adoption, which is affected by Christ and conferred through pneuma. So um, whereas Israel has been adopted by God, according to Romans 9.4, um, the Gentiles, the ex-pagan Gentiles are adopted uh, through Christ. So it's this, this eschatological adoption program that an adoption means that you join a, in, in Roman culture, you, you literally join another family and you become responsible to the, the gods of that family and to the ancestors of that family. But it's a different type of status. Only a non-family member can be adopted into uh, the family. So there's a yes, but aspect to adoption as well. So um, uh, Christ following Jews and Christ following Gentiles constitute one family, uh, but two peoples, I think. And this is how I'd read the Cento in, in Romans uh, 15, rejoice all nations with his people. But um, there's, I would say that there's still a distinction between um, Israel and the nations. How is that possible, uh, given that everybody's uh, soma is going to be made of pneuma? I have, I have no idea. But uh, in terms of reading Paul within Judaism, and this is section five of my paper, I'm a maximalist when it comes to reading Romans 11, 25, and 26. I think the pleroma of the, uh, the nations refers to, and I'm, I'm thinking with James Scott's wonderful book here, it refers to the 70 nations, um, and uh, that all Israel refers to all 12 tribes of Israel, and who uh, is, is the immediate polity that a, a Davidic Messiah is uh, responsible for. In terms of eschatological pilgrimage imagery, if we want to use that or not, uh, it, the Messiah will manifest from the Temple Mount, but the story doesn't end there. And if we think with uh, 1 Corinthians 15 as the wallpaper, 
against which uh, Paul is now saying what he's saying in Romans. Um, God's changed a lot since Isaiah wrote in Hebrew. God's even changed a lot since God started speaking Greek. God has reevaluated his real estate. I think, in uh, this version of apocalyptic Judaism that we're reading when we read uh, Paul's letters. If I wanted to stretch, I could say that, well, there's a Jerusalem above, which is where the uh, Soma Pneumaticon will, uh, will go. But he doesn't say that in Romans. He, he does talk about redemption. And we know from 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about the transformation that is already being worked by indwelling pneuma that will eventuate in the resurrection and transformation of the, both the, the dead and the living so that there's a different type of body and the polytuma is literally in heaven where the stars are so that, um, so that finally the promise to Abraham that his progeny will be as the stars is in a sense literally uh, literally true for Paul, and he's expecting to live to see this. So um, to sum up uh, with my sixth and final word, um, there really isn't such a thing as a Paul within Judaism school, uh, because what happens when uh, people who work with this idea get together at the SBL, and I hope we're able to do this again eventually, we start arguing with each other. So it's it, Paul within Judaism is more like a golf umbrella, very, very big spread and a lot of people under it, but there's, there's uh, a lot of multivocality uh, with people who are working with idea. I think if I had to say, well, is there one doctrinal point uh, in the Paul within Judaism uh, perspective? I would say um, I can't help but think of the controversy between Kazeman and Stendhal uh, on this point, on the epistle to the Romans, where uh, Kaysman said what he said, and Stendhal said that it's really about mission, miss, missiology. It's about including the Gentiles in the redemption promise to Israel. So it's, again, it's about Israel's redemption. I think it's about Israel, meaning the historical Jewish people whose uh, promises are irrevocable, and that Paul's work among non-Jews uh, in the name of Christ, bringing Pneuma to uh, the nations, involved no repudiation of Jewishness. And that's my paper. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, Paula, uh, once again, for being uh, succinct, uh, which gives us uh, a lot of time for questions. So I'll hand over, first of all, to uh, Carl Wilhelm, uh, if you'd like to um, ask some questions or make some comments of your fellow panelists. Yes, of course, I do. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, first of all, to Paula. It was, as always, a pleasure to listening to your presentation, as well as to read your paper, which I did twice, and mm -hmm. which I have done quite a lot of time now. I think since early uh, of the 90s, I read your papers, and I was always, uh, uh, I got a lot of learning from your ideas and your presentations. But I think my task now is not to uh, make any more compliments to you, but to raise uh, some uh, points for our further discussion, which I would like to do with with regard to three points which refer to what you have written in your paper. First, uh, with regard to the question of Jews and Gentiles living in the Roman Empire in the diaspora, your pages three to six. Of course, it was uh, uh, very uh, highlighting what, what you are uh, um, describing there, uh, lots of, of different situations. But what you are describing seems to me is a rather peaceful picture of Jews and Gentiles living together and mixing in the Greco-Roman world. However, what about the conflicts we know of? For instance, the Caligula crisis, the pogroms in Alexandria, or the efforts of Josephus to collect as much as he can privileges and special regulations to protect Jewish communities in the diaspora against lots of trouble. 
On this, see already uh, the, I would like to refer already to the, the book of Gerhard Delling, which appeared already in 1987, where Delling gives a little bit more nuanced picture of Jews living in the diaspora, consisting of an omnipresent tension between, on the one hand, dissociation, what Delling calls Absonderung, and on the other, opening, Öffnung or commitment, Bindung, and mission, Auftrag, or privileges, Sonderrechte, and testing, Erprobung. And I think this tension, this omnipresent tension between both sides is quite important if we look for the situation of Jews living in the diaspora in the uh, Roman Empire. Second point, I refer to the question of Paul the Israelite, uh, your pages six and the following. Of course, I agree to your point about Paul's safe description as an Israelite in Romans nine verses three to five. And I have already uh, expressed quite similar ideas in my book of 1992. However, again, what about the conflicts that Paul had to experience as an apostle as well? Conflicts with Jews and non-Jews, conflicts in synagogues, in the diaspora, as well as in Jerusalem, where he returned quite purposeful. Why does Paul in Romans 9 verses 2 to 3 express to such an extent vividly his deep sorrow and anguish and says that he wishes to be accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of his own people? Is this just rhetoric or does it arise from Paul's deeply felt desire that his fellow Israelites would profit as well from God's eschatological agency in Jesus Christ? And now my third point regarding Kesemann's Paul and the Paul at the SNTS or SBL. That's in the beginning and the end of your paper. I have to confess that during the last three decades, when I attended scholarly meetings, I didn't meet that many exemplars of such anti-scholars who still adhere to Kesemann's view on Paul and Judaism. And neither at the SNTS nor in our German speaking scholarly community. This does not mean that everybody now would subscribe to the Paul within Judaism approach. However, recent discussions about Paul seems to me much more variegated than the picture you give in your critical remarks at the beginning and the end of your paper. It would become still more multifaceted if you would take into consideration quite a lot of monographs and articles published in German or other languages on Paul and Judaism after Käsemann during the last three decades. I'm not sure whom you have in mind as Protestant in recent research, being a Protestant or not, who still adheres to the anti-Catholic view on Paul stemmed by the conflicts of the 16th century. So here I stand and that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, there's... Uh, Yes, to for your first thing, there it's not sweetness and light and Woodstock all the time in the diaspora. There are tensions, but I think this idea of a con of the Jewish question is something that comes from a later period in European history and is not something that is. Uh, I mean, there were there were ethnic tensions between different ethnic groups. Uh, so. Uh, and then um, Pucci Benzev's uh, book co that collects uh, Jewish law, uh, protecting Jewish populations, also gives traction exactly to your uh, your important point. Um, second, your second point about uh, Paul getting into uh, trouble with other Israelites. He's I he's my point there is not that Paul gets along with everybody. That's the last thing I would say and the last thing I think Paul would think of uh, with himself. I think the reason for the conflicts that he describes in 2 Corinthians 11, <laughs> excuse me, um, has to do with um, the way he endangers the, um, the local Jewish community by turning uh, 
local ethne away from the gods who supervene the well-being of the city. I think it's a it's a political and social issue. I don't think it has to do with Paul eating a cheeseburger when he is uh, eating in common with um, uh, with non-Jews. His anguish in Romans nine um, and following that whole passage from nine to fifteen uh, is rhetorically incredibly powerful. And I think the the anguish he's, I mean, I, I deal with this with my own students. They're always asking me uh, how an ancient author really felt about something. And I try to explain that we don't have access to that. What we have, if we have writings from somebody, is somebody who is rhetorically trained to persuade, uh, which means that we can't count on their descriptions of their own opponents. And um, we have to allow ourselves to be emotionally um, manipulated is probably a bit strong, but um, led along emotionally by somebody who, who is skillful at, at ancient rhetoric. That's how, uh, that's how people were trained. Um, in terms of um, scholarship on Paul, I have another article that's coming out in um, the Harvard Theological Review on messy monotheism, and I did have the benefit of a lot of uh, German scholarship there. This was a paper I put together, uh, as you can tell by the footnotes, um, on the run. In terms of uh, Protestantizing, I want to point again to, it's, it's Jonathan Z. Smith's historiographical observation, and I would just defer to that monograph um, for that point. And um, the idea of uh, somehow grace being the opposite of the law or the law being the opposite of the gospel is a kind of rhetorical trope that I do see currently in, in many things. Smith characterized it as Protestantizing, and he attributed that to the Renaissance. I We were going to have a panel at the SBL where Tony Grafton, who is a historian of Renaissance historiography, was actually going to speak to that point. That's well outside of my own competence. But I thank you for it. Um, I thank you for those corrections because that's exactly what they are. Thank you for correcting me. Uh well, thank you for that, for that exchange. That was great. I found myself um, constantly um, nodding with Paula, then kind of every now and again raising an eyebrow. I would say um, what I find interesting, though, um, I can't say speak about Germany, but certainly in um, English speaking scholarship, I would say there is a little bit of a Kaiserman romanticism uh, in certain places, particularly in the uh, apocalyptic Paul sort of school of thought there. And I think there's been a recent publication of um, Kaiserman essays in English just within the last year or so. So I, I think um, Kaiserman is certainly um, venerated or let me venerate the right word, but certainly esteemed in certain bastions of scholarship still. Uh, I guess the question I have for, for Paula concerning the, uh, the, the non-soterial logical value of law observance it's just jews being jews which i think makes perfect sense but every now and again some some um person in antiquity i does seem to uh, attribute a so a soteric value to it at least when it comes to um outsiders becoming insiders and if you what came to my mind initially was luke uh, was acts 15 where you've got luke setting up the debate between um, Antioch and Jerusalem and you know, you know, the Jerusalem Council, Luke sets the, the, the discussion up um, uh, in terms of, you know, that the Gentiles must, well, the ethne must observe the law to be saved. And, and that's the language that Luke uses. Now, obviously, Luke is not Paul, but Luke is an interpreter of Paul. He's looking at the Pauline debates and saying, this is a debate about salvation. Um, Whereas really it's a, it's a debate about, you know, do, do the ethne have to become in whole or in part um, Yehudios to be part of these um, Christ-believing assemblies? Uh, is that because Luke is a, a different generation, Paula? Or is, is, is this at least one way of understanding the debates that Paul's having within his own community? 
Well, I, th I think that, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, Acts 15 is obviously a very important text for, uh, for us. I think that um, in terms of if you're in a, I've described elsewhere that Jewish apocalyptic thought is a river in an ocean of Jewishness. And if you're in an apocalyptic, uh, let, let me mix metaphors hope for, hopelessly, uh, frequency, um, there, everything becomes, a, a messianic movement is about soteriology. And if you're not part of a messianic movement, you're, you know, your family's always eaten like this. Your family's always done this this way. This is what you do in the middle of April or something like that. So it's um, the law itself intrinsically and in, as enacted isn't done as a soteriological effort. I think what Luke is dealing with there is one of the way, and I can't remember which of you has already said this uh, in the two previous um, meetings. Um, Luke is dealing with a course correction there because that's a way that Paul is beginning to be interpreted, and he's um, and he's saying no. Okay, good. That's I think I think that's right. I mean, the Jews are just keeping the law and being Jewish. Uh, they're not constantly thinking, "Am I earning my salvation as I'm doing this?" But when um, you do it differently. I want to uh, give a, um, a nod to the much maligned allegorizers in Alexandria. <laughs> um, they weren't being lax about uh, circumcision. They were being so committed to a spiritual understanding of the law that they didn't circumcise because that wasn't what the law was actually doing. It was pointing toward, um, and this will uh, touch on uh, with the next paper, pointing to the higher meaning of the law that the material enactment of the law was a shadow of, um, in a sense. So the um, different Jews did things differently. And the rule of thumb is somebody to the right of you is a fanatic and somebody to the left of you is, is sloppy. And it doesn't matter where the person in the middle is. That's, that's just a general rule. But there's, I think the point that's coming out so usefully in this, in this conference is the variety of ancient, we can't speak of, that's why I talked about Judaism being our heuristic device and it's different enactments of Jewishness that is the situation on the ground. Thank you. I think we can open up for our questions a little bit broader now as well. Uh, so anyone from the uh, from the wider group have any questions for Professor Fedrick? Uh, Jürgen, uh, I'll hand over to you. Yes, Paula, thank you for your uh, paper. I would like to to uh, push a bit further the question of Carl Wilhelm on Romans nine, the first verses. If we are, if we agree that Paul was an strongly shaped by apocalyptic thought, um, mm -hmm. eschatolo eschatology was very important for him. The 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 acting of the spirit uh, is is important for him. So this is, I think, um, an opens up the category that we can speak in Paul's terms of soteriology, what the, of course the rabbis don't do and a kind of covenantal Judaism uh, doesn't do, but not every Judaism is covenantal Judaism in, in that unified sense, but we have that uh, those uh, apocalyptic writings that uh, of course uh, reckon with the fact that within Israel there are people who who leave uh, the the community or who leave the um the community with god uh, and and all these experiences i think um help to understand also paul's uh, wrestling about uh, that his kin's people uh, should be should share that um blessing of uh, of 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 the messiah and not not be cut off and and uh, the, the the rhetorical figure at the beginning of romans 9 is something like well almost like Moses. So I would be rather cut off and uh, that they that they receive uh, the, the the blessing. So uh, can we can we uh, from the apocalyptic thought, can we find a, a clue for these for these um, expressions? The, the expressions of grief and frustration. Um, and, and also also that he presupposes that his 
some of his kin's people are not sharers in that uh, uh, beneficial right. situation uh, in the Messiah in the Messiah that God has uh, brought up. Right. I, th I think, um, uh, like Gaul, uh, Jews are divided into three group groups for Paul. There are the Jews who agree with him. They're the Israel of God and the, the called and the remnant currently on the right page. There are the Jews within the movement who disagree with him. He still calls them Israelites. There's still Israelites, there's still Hebrews, there's still sons of Abraham. So even, even his opposition um, is uh, still considered under the umbrella. And in terms of the rest of Israel, what Paul sees is a divine comedy uh, by the time, because nine sets up the resolution that we see in 11 and repeated in, in 15. I mean, he's, he's, it's so powerful. And that's what gives the, every, all Israel will be saved is where that, where nine, one and two is, is uh, leading to. So I think, uh, again, uh, this goes back um, uh, to another question. I think that Paul thinks that ultimately both his people and the fullness of the nations are going to receive the grace of Christ. I think for him, history ends on a single note for both human groups. Um, and that's the, that's the big picture that we see at the, at the end of Romans. So I, I think, and on this point, I like Origen more than I like Augustine. Um, mm -hmm. God doesn't throw anyone away. Everybody is saved, but it's everybody saved through Christ, I think, is what Paul is saying there. Mm -hmm. If I may, if I may um, push back a bit, Paul had pains to come to that conclusion, and he, in the, in the end state, it was a it was a revelation, a kind of mysterion uh, given to him, and and we see that uh, at least uh, at some parts of his uh, way before that, uh, Paul was not convinced uh, of that solution he got in the end, and he now phrases in the end of Romans eleven. Right, and he also he had wrath going after the um, the Thessalonians who did not know God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right, and then that whole idea of wrath is um, nobody, everybody's going to be saved at the at the end, uh, according to I I like to think is is what Paul meant when I read Paul. That's what I want him to mean. But you're right. There's a he his thought changes. Thank you, Jürgen. I believe, uh, Ron, you've got a question as well. Uh, yes, sure. Well, thank you again, uh, Paula, for the paper and, uh, and the summary. Um, I have this uh, that I've been struggling with uh, to understand, and uh, I hope that you can help me here, is Paul is, he is Judaizing the, the ethne, and you have ex, and this is using your language, ex-pagan Gentiles Christ following or Christ followers. But do they, what do they become? <laughs> when you say, do they become Jews because they are ex-pagan Gentiles? What do they become? Um, it depends if you're talking to Josh Garraway or to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking uh, to you. <laughs> um, I think they become eschatological Gentiles, the type of Gentiles who are available as narrative characters in Isaiah. And those those passages of um, they're they're Gentiles who have or the Gentiles you see in Tobit who who smash their idols and turn to um, and turn to God. And uh, one of the reasons I, I I think Josh and I are actually say, talking about the same thing is that Gentile Jew uh, is that still your term of choice, Josh? I don't want to lama law. Okay. Um, it, it's it's a family connection, but it's it's a family that's a family of uh, people adopted into the family. So they're they're not Jews. That's that's the point. Uh, but they're not pagans either. That's also the point. And the God they're worshiping is not just a generic Theos Hypsistos. He's the God who's the father of the Davidic Messiah. <laughs> 
No, by the way, I would just add to that that I, I think the problem is there. The point of the term Gentile Jew was simply to note that there is no term. And that's precisely why a term like Christian ultimately emerges, because you have a phenomenon that you can't describe with the language that exists. So new language emerges. That's that was what I would say. Right. Because it, it's what's this is what's so makes me so happy that we have this evidence remaining from this earlier point in the movement. Um, it's a sociological anomaly, a novum that's being brought into existence through this movement. And that's why um, I hesitate to use the word Christian, even though I, that's what I'm sort of thinking in a way, because Christianity as a separate thing from Judaism doesn't, isn't something Paul Denver knew. So. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paula. That was, uh, that was terrific. Uh, I think now I'll hand over to uh, Carl Wilhelm uh, for his paper about, uh, I believe, on grace in Judaism. Over to you, Carl Wilhelm. And that, thanks again, Paula. Thank you very much. In my following presentation, I intend to broaden and to press ahead the debate on Paul within Judaism by including in my survey a source contemporary to Paul that has its own history and place with regard to a within Judaism debate. The letter of James is considered to be Jewish by several modern authors, although it has been transmitted only as part of the New Testament. The author in the letter prescript builds his argument on his self-introduction as slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he reminds his brothers and sisters to their common faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, this does not make him a real Christian for some modern exegetes or his letter a Christian source, because most of the features typical for other Christian documents are missing here, particularly in comparison to Paul. I wonder whether the recent debate on the Epistle of James and its place in the New Testament may shed some light on the Paul within Judaism debate as well. Perhaps this debate can be fertilized by realizing that the place of other NT writings with regard to Jewish sources contemporary to them is at stake as well. By taking into account such debates, perhaps the Paul within Judaism debate develops to a Paul within the New Testament discourse that may prove to be fruitful for both ancient Jewish studies and New Testament scholarship. The methodological approach I'm going to apply here is borrowed from the Corpus Judeo Hellenisticum project that undertakes to study ancient Jewish and New Testament texts in mutual perception. Wechselseitige Wahrnehmung. By speaking of Wechselseitige Wahrnehmung, I want to indicate that the New Testament writings are to be acknowledged as part of Hellenistic Jewish literature in a broader sense and can be used to complete our understanding of ancient Jewish religion and culture. Applied to Paul's letters and to the question of their relationship to the Epistle of James, this approach implies that both documents own a potential to broaden our horizon when we ask in which way Paul and James as well can be arranged within the plurality of expressions of Jewish practice and belief in the period of the Roman Empire. Most Pauline scholars meanwhile accept that the Judaism-Christianity divide has proved to be anachronistic with regard to the historical origins and the developments of Paul's mission to the Gentiles. This consensus applies to the terminology used and to the historical realities behind it if we take into oh. account the plurality of Jewish groups and convictions and the plurality of groups and convictions of Christ followers as well, to avoid the term Christians. I hope that such a consensus will grow likewise in Jamesian studies. Both Paul and the letter of James, irrespective of the identification of the letter's historical author, should be listened to as voices that express beliefs and push religious attitudes and behaviors that are deeply rooted in the convictions of the people of Israel, as testified in the scriptures and in ancient Jewish texts. 
Before I start my brief survey of texts, I want to clarify some of my assumptions with regard to the historical circumstances of Paul's letters and the epistle of James, and with regard to the theological convictions expressed by them. I assume that Paul and James wrote their letters independent of each other, although both certainly knew of each other as important figures of the earliest stages of the Jesus movement. Furthermore, both authors base their theological arguments on the conviction that Jesus is the Lord. That means the eschatological representative of the God of Israel who acted to fulfill God's will and to cause a new life for those who direct their faith in him. This implies that both belonged to the variegated and widespread religious movement that emerged from the impact of the life and death of Jesus from Nazareth. In addition, both authors build their theological arguments on the scriptures of Israel and argue that in these scriptures, God had revealed his eschatological plans for his people. For both James and Paul, the salvation of Israel forms a constitutive part of their religious convictions. Yet at the same time, both base their arguments on faith in Jesus Christ, although by developing quite different ways of reasoning to justify their convictions. The main difference between Paul and James refers to the place of the Gentiles in the run of the eschatological events and to the consequences resulting from this place for the religious behavior and the beliefs of the communities they address. Whereas for Paul, the inclusion of Gentiles into the communities of believers without becoming Jews by accepting circumcision forms an identity marker of his mission and his theological arguments, that matter seems to be ignored completely in the epistle of James. Therefore, the theological arguments in the letters of Paul and James, although sometimes sounding very close to each other, should be carefully distinguished. The thesis I'm going to demonstrate in the following survey of texts is that Paul and James are two different Jewish voices that speak about the salvific agency of God in Jesus Christ at the end of time. Both, therefore, represent in different ways agencies of grace in Judaism. I start my analysis by comparing two passages that usually do not play any role in the debate on Paul and James as related to each other. The argument in James chapter 1, 13 to 18, on the one hand, belongs to the soteriological center of the letter, uh, to say it with Matthias Conrad. What Paul renders in 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6, on the other, is part of his argument to defend his claim to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, both arguments base upon a reference to God, the creator of the world, who has acted eschatologically by sending Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, to salvage those who believe in him, God, by believing in him, Jesus Christ. This makes both texts fitting for our search for agencies of grace in Paul and Judaism. I skip the next paragraph. It is apparent that the theological and ethical intentions of the letter base on faith in God and Jesus Christ and direct the addressees to a practice and belief that focus particularly on fair social relations. However, before it comes to faith and works in James, the thematic concern of the letter is the origin of faith in God's agency. The unity of hearing and doing, of receiving the word of God and displaying the faith received by disposing justice to each other, results from the faith donated to the believers. At the sociological center of his letter, the author does not speak of the relationship between faith and works, Instead, he stresses the good gifts of God from above, the word of truth by which the believers are newly born as firstlings of his creatures. And the process of receiving and listening to the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. In James 1.17, God appears the second time in the letter as a generous donator. Already in 1 verse 5, the author had appeared, appealed to his readers, if any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given you. 
Now in chapter 1 verse 17, he renders it like a mnemonic that every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The terms Pasa Dosis Agate and Pandore Martellion seem to be interchangeable. The pleonastic phrases Pasa, Kaipan express rhetorical power. The addressees may expect from God anything imaginable good. For the author of the letter of James, as well as for his audience, God is above and is called the father of lights. Such terminology points to conceptions of God in Hellenistic Roman and biblical and early Jewish sources as well. The lights probably refer to the heavenly luminary bodies that belong to most of ancient conceptions of nature. In the Greek Bible, however, the plural phota for the stars occurs only once in Psalm 135. The only parallel for the term pater ton photon in non-biblical Jewish texts comes from the Greek life of Adam and Eve. When Seth and his mother Eve in a vision watched two Ethiopians in heaven, these gloomy fellows proved to be sun and moon, whose lights appear black in comparison to the light of the universe, the father of lights. Even the angels in heaven venerate God as father of lights. To call God father is a common concept in antiquity. The Homeric phrase about Zeus as father of gods and human beings is perceived in Platonism and Stoicism to reflect the relationship between the divine and the cosmos. In Hellenistic Roman philosophical theology as part of metaphysics, such a combination of reflections about God as father, the origin of the cosmos, and the power of the divine over the cosmos and over human beings formed an area of reflection that became fr a fruitful land for early Jewish theological thinking as well. Certainly, to avoid any mythic implications about a divine procreation of the cosmos, the biblical restrictions of understanding of God bounded by the first commandment of the Decalogue remained valid for every Jewish thinker. However, this confinement did not prevent them to reflect on the relationship between God and the creation by borrowing terms and conceptions from Greek philosophical traditions. Philo polemicizes against those who admire the cosmos more than its creator and demands them to acknowledge and respect the divine powers of God, the creator and father of the universe in Deopificio Mundi chapter 7. The wisdom of Solomon appeals to God the father because in his providence he steers the course of a ship through the ocean and has given it a path in the sea and a safe way through the waves. Wisdom chapter 14. Josephus summons his readers to recognize the nature of God and to imitate his works because he is the father and lord of all. The most complete quotation of the Homeric phrase together with God's qualification as creator of the universe occurs in Philo in his De Specialibus Legibus when he explains the Jewish understanding of God. And I skip the longer quotation I give in my paper. The author of James seems to be rather remote to such religious and philosophical reflections. Nevertheless, the term father of lights that he uses points to the cultural and ideological horizon under which he develops his own understanding of the agency of God who has acted to save those who direct their faith in God and Jesus Christ. The term bouletes in James chapter 118 refers to God's unchangeable goodness and his will to save his people as realized by the believers. The verbal aspect aorist makes plain that an action of God is in view here, not an abstract attribute. It points to an event that has happened already and is received by the addressees as a saving act of God towards them. God is the one who had intended to bring the believers into new life by his word of truth and who did so already meanwhile. This act of birthing up a cuisin unites James and his audience, Hamas. Formulations in the first person plural are rather rare in James. They occur only here and in chapter 2 verse 1 in the first two chapters. <clears throat> 
according to the letter prescript, as in 2.1, the author and the addressees appear subordinated together to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The imagery of procreation and childbirth occurs twice in 1.15 and 1.18. By this terminology, the agency of God as father towards human beings, in this case towards the believers, takes on a motherly aspect as well. The sequel of the argument shows that an act of creation is in view, tismata. however, those who are the recipients of God's agency as creator are members of the communities of believers in God and Jesus Christ. They are encouraged by the author to maintain their faith and to make it visible in their everyday life. Therefore, the process of, procre of creation here in view refers to the event of having become Christ followers, not to the creation of all humankind, according to Genesis 1 and 2. If those who still are alive as human beings are fathered again and born once more, they become something else, something new than what they had been before. In addition, by describing the act of becoming a Christ follower as a recurrence of birth, James highlights the passive attitude of the believers in view of their reception of the gift of faith. Of course, James wants to encourage them to an active way of life, in particular by pointing them to the needs of the poor and weak and by reproving them to avoid hostilities in their communities. However, the beginning of their faith is a gift from God, an event of procreation and birth where the fetus as the neonates are completely passive. Thus, if the author in James 1.18 speaks of God's will and his agency, he refers to the event of receiving faith in God and Jesus Christ. The word of truth, therefore, can be nothing else than the message and the means which have made the readers who share the faith of the author something new. This message roots in the fate of Jesus Christ, the risen crucified. By accepting this message as a gift from God, the addressees have been transformed from members of the 12 tribes in the diaspora into the community of Christ's believers, a fellowship of sisters and brothers who are underway to eschatological salvation. Therefore, James 1.18 must refer to the salvific agency of God and Jesus Christ, even though the author does not clarify the procedure of salvation by faith in Christ. In any case, an eschatological event is in view, although James identifies it as have happened already by using Aorist forms. Now I turn to the Pauline passage. I have to be much more brief then, so I will skip uh, parts of my paper, but I would like just to give some idea of my interpretation of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. I uh, follow up on page 8. Paul describes this paragraph, uh, in this paragraph, the moment of coming into contact with the gospel as visual experience. Therefore, we may assume here a reference to Paul's own visionary experience in the course of his conversion. The term image of God attributed to Christ in verse 4 may refer to Genesis 1.26, according to which all humankind has been made in God's image and likeness. However, in the context of 2 Corinthians 4, the visual experience mentioned points to the perception of God by receiving the image of Christ. Thus, in verse 6, Paul speaks of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Therefore, visual perception and reflective insight focus to this particular human being called Jesus Christ, not to any human beings created in the image of God. This Christological interpretation of the image of God is emphasized by the term doxa that pervades the whole argument. By calling his proclamation the gospel of the glory of Christ, Paul creates an inseparable link between his ministry and his message. Both are qualified by divine glory. Becoming a believer means to listen to the gospel message and to experience the illumination of the heart by the divine glory that leads to the perception of Christ in his divine glory. Of course, as Paul hastens to add, Christ's divine glory is the glory of the crucified Jesus and his followers, the apostles in particular, are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies.
The above mentioned encounter between Christ and human beings provoked by the proclamation of the gospel can be either successful or not. Yet in both cases, this does not depend on the human beings, but on divine aid, on a divine agent who possesses the power to preclude or to make possible such an encounter. If some of the recipients of Paul's proclamation are called unbelievers or those who are perishing, it is because the God of this world has blinded their minds and therefore the gospel remained wailed for them. The same refers to Paul himself as a representative of the believers. If he claims to having seen in his conversion the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, this is because the true and merciful God has enlightened him to perceive the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Again, like in James, the ends that Paul refers to occur in formulations with Aorist forms to point to actions that had happened in the past. References to the Book of Wisdom and to Philo would make plain that such perceptions of the agency of God with regard to the fate of human beings are common in early Jewish theological reflection, but I have to skip all these passages and uh, I come to my conclusions. By way of conclusion, I attempt to sum up some of the results of my surveys of two passages from James and Paul. At the outset, I repeat to emphasize that my argument does not imply any literary or traditional historical relationship between the two texts analyzed. If I try to compare James 1 and 2 Corinthians 4 under the aspect of agencies of grace as expressed in these texts, it is to search for different ways of reasoning independent of each other about the question of how God acts in the Christ event. I assume that both Paul and James ground their theological reflections in their own experience of faith in Jesus Christ, and that they both intend to have an impact by their theological arguments to the practice and the beliefs of their letter audiences. However, neither do I intend to argue for a typically Christian understanding of agencies of grace as represented or even bordered by James and Paul, nor do I imply that Paul and James in their theological re reflections refer to each other in whatever direction. What connects them is a sort of meta-level agreement, a rootedness in common religious beliefs. On the one hand, they share some of the convictions of the early Jesus movement. For both, Jesus is the Lord. God and uh, Jesus Christ form a union in the view of the believers, and those who believe in God and Jesus Christ will receive eschatological salvation and completion in future. On the other hand, both authors agree by approving fundamental beliefs about God that are founded in the testimony of the scriptures of Israel, as expressed in a great number of early Jewish writings of their time, beginning with the Septuagint. In the two passages analyzed a bit more in detail here, Paul as well as James refer to God, the creator of the universe, when they attempt to explain the process by which human beings have come to believe in Jesus Christ. The motive of creation of light as part of the biblical account on creation occurs in both passages, although in variable interpretations and with different meta thoughts. For James, the phrase father of lights is just an allusion to the biblical account of creation. His primary focus is on God who acts as a father and as a mother, likewise, to create the, to create the believers in Christ as firstlings of a new creation by donating them his word of truth. The believers that James addresses shall remember the good gifts that they have received from God to become newly born creatures. They shall trust in the power of these gifts that will save their souls. For Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, the references to the biblical creation account are more thoroughly reflected and developed. He not only quotes verbally several phrases from that report, but by using a term that refers to every human creature in the biblical creation account, he identifies the Lord Jesus Christ as the eschatological image of God. The motive of light taken from the creation account, Paul applies to the process of receiving and gathering the gospel. Being enlightened by God leads the believers to recognize Jesus as the eschatological representative of God. 
thereby the visual aspects included in Paul's reference to his conversion take on the character of understanding and knowledge. Perception, recognition, and reflection become part of the process of becoming a Christ believer. Both James and Paul in their arguments about perceiving the Christ event prove to be related to reflections in Hellenistic Jewish literary works on the agency of God towards his creation and towards humankind. Again, this is not a question of literary or tradition historical dependence. The passages from Philo or the Book of Wisdom examined in our survey discuss different matters and use other motives than Paul and James in their epistolary arguments. Of course, they have nothing to do with Jesus Christ and with the question of how to become a Christ believer. However, in their particular ways of thinking and believing, they do reflect the problem of how it happens that the God of Israel, the divine power as perceived in the scriptures, can be effective in the world created and can be perceived by human beings in their everyday life. Disregarding their explicit references to Jesus Christ, therefore, Paul and James would figure quite suitable among other Jewish thinkers who reflect on the agency of God towards humankind. What marks out the reflections of both Paul and James about how to become a Christ believer are the eschatological prospects they develop in their arguments. However, even this eschatological perspective does not lead them beyond the boundaries of Jewish thinking, if there ever had been such. In the Book of Wisdom, the eschatological perspective is determined by the fate of the ungodly and the righteous. Those who trust in God and the fate of their sufferings during their earthly life will shine forth in the time of their visitations. Whereas the godless shall be as though they had never been. And there a lot of time is the passing of a shadow. In Philo, such eschatological perspectives are rare if present at all. However, this follows from his philosophical perspective towards the universe as consisting of the invisible realm of ideas and the material sense perceptible world that is structured by time and space. For Philo, completion of the universe, therefore, is a process of purification of the world of ideas from any material components, not the least by discarding every ethical impurities. In any case, if James and Paul direct their views towards the eschatological completion of the creation by God and towards the salvation of those who believe in Christ, this does not make them un-Jewish. Rather, their particular way of dealing with the problem of future expectations results from their faith that is rooted in the biblical promises about God's agency towards his people and shaped by referring to Jesus Christ as the foundation of their eschatological salvation. Thus, James and Paul agree to each other about the agency of God who enables and brings forth eschatological salvation for human beings who direct their faith in Jesus Christ. For both, God is a subject of the events that transform human beings to followers of Jesus Christ by faith. For both, such faith is a gift of God, not a work of the believers. In the understanding of both James and Paul, to believe is a passive attitude that orients the minds and the whole lives of the believers to the agency of God, an attitude of receptiveness. However, both also agree that such a faith has to become visible in the attitude of the believers towards their neighbors, to the weak and the poor in particular. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Wilhelm, it was excellent. Uh, Paula, I'll offer uh, open to you if you want a, a write a reply or a comment or anything you want to add to that. Um. This was such an amazing combination of very, very fine-grained exegesis with an amazing helicopter tour of the possibilities of philosophical Hellenistic Judaism. I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much for um, the paper. I So much of it lies beyond my expertise. I, I hesitate to, to ask a question, but I will anyway. Um, on page uh, two, I'll ask several, and then you can, uh, with the time we have, you can uh, choose how to, um, which to answer. On page two, in the uh, almost in the middle of the page, uh, you you're talking about uh, the Lord as the eschatological representative of, of the God of Israel. Uh, 
This implies that both belonged to the variegated and widespread religious movement that emerged from the impact of the life and death of Jesus. Um, I wanted to, I was surprised you didn't say, and the resurrection of Jesus and his return. So I, I wondered if I was, um, how you, met, how you wanted us to think about eschatology when um, you compared James and, uh, and, and Paul on that issue. A second question uh, has to do with uh, Middle Platonism and your incredibly enlightening, enlightening is the right word, um, uh, discussion with uh, Philo and uh, Deo Pificio Mundi. Uh, this is on page 10. Uh, talking about uh, Philo's conceptualization, it's the, it's the block paragraph that's quoted there. I won't read the quotation. Um, and, and Philo, because of this two-layer universe, um, Jörg, I, I also thought of John 3 with if you're not born from above um, or uh, born again. The, if for Philo, what seems to be the thread of compromise of this light uh, where he has here, the unmixed and pure gleam has its brightness dim when it begins to undergo a change from the intelligible to the sense perceptible. Um, thinking with middle Platonism, it, does Philo, and this is a question about Philo, um, does he talk about Hule as um, something that is responsible for uh, this, this mixture of uh, above and below that co can compromise um, uh, the, I don't know, to call it the believer, the thinker almost uh, in Philo. And then finally, a third question uh, you mentioned in 2 Corinthians 4.4, uh, 4, the, uh, the agents who fight, this, the non-human agents that fight against um, um, the will of God, the pro, God's program, God's grace. Um, and I wondered again if in terms of the Philo and wisdom, if what um, Paul characterizes as a, a lower deity, um, and elsewhere he talks about Satan being an agent of frustration, um, if that's a personification of the sort of thing that's hardwired into Philo's metaphysics with um, Hule uh, and Theos uh, in relation with Hule and Theos with Cosmos um, in the middle and take your pick. I know we don't have time for all three questions, but thank you so much for your paper. Well, thank you for, for these interesting questions and uh, important points. And I only can, in a very limited way, uh, react to your questions. First, uh, regarding resurrection um, as part of what we uh, call the Christ event. Uh, I hesitated to include resurrection at that uh, uh, thought when I uh, wrote it because of course, in James, uh, resurrection is just uh, implicit. It's not explicit there, uh, uh, other than in Paul. I'm quite sure that also for the author of the, the epistle of James, resurrection would be a part of his, uh, his cosmos of uh, convictions. Otherwise, I couldn't imagine that he can himself introduce as the slave of Jesus Christ, as he does in, in, the, in the preface of, of in, uh, uh, prescript of his letter. This implies that uh, he would, uh, would share the common belief of others who belong to this movement that uh, the Christ uh, is risen. Uh, he also doesn't speak about the crucifixion of, of Jesus, of course, uh, the, the author of James. Uh, uh, but it, it's implicit, uh, other than in Paul, where it is explicit. I think there's not that big difference that one should uh, see here uh, uh, um, um, what is Widerspruch, uh, an opposition uh, between uh, uh, James and, and Paul. For me, 
But uh, in this uh, part of my argument, it's more important to, uh, to say that both have a common ground, uh, a common ground in this movement, which we shouldn't uh, call Christianity, uh, but rather a, a Jesus Christ movement. And uh, there are several parts uh, who belong to this shared common uh, faith, uh, uh, and this is Jesus is the Lord, and Jesus, this implies his uh, resurrection, and the resurrection implies his crucifixion. So I wouldn't make such a big difference here. The other two points refer to Philo, and of course, one uh, would have to be much more deeper in this part. It's, it's very uh, on the surface what I am explaining here. Uh, if we try to compare Paul and Philo or to, to put both in a sort of spectrum of, of uh, opinions shared in, in this Jewish Hellenistic world of thinking, I would say uh, we have to have in mind the, the difference of genre. Uh, Paul is not a philosopher, but Philo is in a way. Uh, both refer to the Torah of Moses as their basic uh, uh, level of, of uh, reflection, but uh, they uh, do different sorts of literature. Whereas Philo uh, uh, creates really philosophical arguments and also uses sometimes uh, genres uh, of, of philosophical literature, dialogue, for instance. I mean, not in the Optificio Mundi, but it, it's a treatise. Uh, but uh, there Philo quotes uh, verbally philosophical authors, Greek authors, and, and uh, calls their names. And that's quite different than Paul. Paul has a, a rather a related. Um, universe of ideas in mind, but he is doing another sort of literature. And so when Philo uh, speaks about Hüle and speaks about the sense perceptible world and, and the world of ideas, this is a form of, of reflection uh, Paul doesn't is interested that much in. So uh, uh, Paul maybe is a little bit more close to uh, ancient Jewish traditions from uh, about a second power in heaven or about uh, Satan, about uh, other powers he has to to uh, take honest, but he doesn't do philosophical reflection. And this maybe is the biggest uh, distinction between Paul on the one hand and Philo on the other. And so Paul and the author of the letter of James are much close, much more close to each other than both are to Philo. But for me, it's more important to see that they all agree with regard to their base of, of reflection, and that is the scriptures of Israel. And of course, uh, uh, Paul and James share the common faith in Jesus Christ. Sorry, I, that's just very briefly, but thank uh, you. I hope. Uh, thank you. I, I have another question. Is, is that okay? <laughs> um, I just got the first volume of the Historical and Theological Lexicon of the Septuagint, Volume 1, which um, is about five centimeters thick and it only gets to gamma. Um, and what struck me as I looked through it is that the uh, definitions of the terms in this lexicon are laid out Hellenistic Jewish literature. And then the next category after that is the New Testament. If you were the editor of this volume, you would not have done that, am I correct? You are correct, and I'm not the editor, but I'm one of the authors, and so I, I did the article on anastasis uh, in, in this lexicon, okay. and of course I had a problem uh, with this distinction. Uh, one could define it otherwise, and maybe it would be better to include New Testament, and that's my point, to include New, New Testament texts as parts of the Hellenistic Jewish literature. In, right. uh, I think this we have to uh, to do, uh, and then we can find specific uh, um, specific uh, um, points which maybe distinguish New Testament texts or several of the New Testaments from other. Hellenistic Jewish texts, but they also distinguish uh, those texts from other New Testament texts. So that's not the border between the New Testament and the Hellenistic literature. I think we agree about that. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, the taxonomy makes it hard to do the history, right? And, and the lexicography. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I think it's um, just about time for a break. Um, the only comment I have on that, um, Carl Wilhelm, I was, while you were giving the paper, I was thinking if we had a time machine and we could go give Martin Luther a copy of your paper, I wonder if the history of Protestantism would have been diff slightly different. Um, certainly, I think maybe Martin Luther's preface to James may have been a little bit more generous. Um, yeah, but, but uh, if you look to the sermons Luther gave about the letter of James in the late 30s of the 16th century, you will find quite a lot of surprise there. Uh, uh, no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> Guess I'm uh, thinking here of Luther more by reputation and um, less than by reading. Uh, but there we go. Uh, well, that's probably a good note for us to have a break on. And uh, let's take a let's take a um, 15, 20 minute break to refresh our um, tea, coffee, or schnapps, or whatever you're doing in your part of the world. And uh, we'll come back after the break. We'll be hearing from uh, Brian Rosner and also from Ron Charles. So, um, yeah, get, get yourself a nice beverage and I'll see you shortly. Great. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone, for uh, this event. I've been learning a lot um, and uh, really looking forward to seeing the publication come out in a few years time and to get your feedback in a few minutes. Uh, so in this session, we're moving on to Paul's own Jewish identity and specifically uh, in relation to his Gentile mission. So the question I'm trying to consider is the extent to which Paul upholds his Jewish identity as apostle to the Gentiles. Now clearly uh, scholarly opinions divided as to the Jewishness of let's say the Christian Paul. Jürgen Becker for example holds that Paul made a fundamental break with Judaism after the Damascus Road experience um, Georg Strecker, very similar. Uh, by way of contrast, Jorg has argued uh, that Paul never abandoned his Jewish identity and some of the convictions he held as a Pharisee remained influential for his work as an apostle. And uh, Carl Wilhelm has a book on Paul's autobiographical statements that concludes that Paul's Jewish identity had ongoing significance for his work as apostle of the Gentiles and he uses his Jewish identity to argue several points of his theology. Uh, I like the way James Dunn puts it. Paul could never have accepted that his apostleship to the Gentiles con constituted apostasy from Israel. Quite the contrary, this is James Dunn again. He was apostle to the Gentiles precisely as apostle for Israel and apostle of Israel. So I've taken my... Uh, the title of my paper from uh, Carl Wilhelm's book, Haydn Apostel aus Israel, uh, Apostle to the Gentiles from Israel. You could swap prepositions there for Israel or even of Israel. I think Israel is significant in terms of choice of words. In Acts, Luke has Paul call himself a Jew twice, but Paul prefers to call himself an Israelite in his own letters. And as Mike has suggested, the designations Israel and Israelite were positive for Paul as they denoted continuity with God's purposes and plans first announced to the patriarchs and fulfilled in the economy of God's action in Jesus Christ. So as much time as we've got, uh, I'd like to think about the question of uh, Paul's Jewish identity and his Gentile mission from three angles, uh, looking at his own identity, his self-understanding, uh, his fundamental beliefs, and his strategy in the Gentile mission. So basically, I'm arguing to use Paul as terms that Paul's Gentile mission was Paul's enactment of Jewishness. Uh, it was really Paul's way of being Jewish. So I see a lot of continuity between the pre-Christian and, uh, and, and uh, missionary Paul in terms of his Jewishness. First then, uh, the notion of Paul's own identity as he saw it. Uh, obviously, there are many answers to the question of the identity of the Apostle Paul. He was a Jew, a Roman citizen, a follower of Christ, a tent maker, a letter writer, a missionary, a community founder, a teacher, a sage, a cu curator of a collection, a networker, and so on, a prisoner, a traveler. Um, I think all of these are best understood clearly uh, when considered in the context of the ancient world. And there are 
points of contact with contemporary Greek or Roman and uh, Jewish comparable identities and occupations. Uh, there's a couple of recent books on Paul as a, a founder of communities, Paul as a teacher, which do this sort of work. But I think they all impinge upon or relate to his Gentile mission in one way or another. But apart from the first three, uh, namely uh, Paul the Jew, Roman citizen, follower of Christ, they're really functional identities capturing a facet of his prodigious and varied activity. However, I think there are five other descriptions of Paul that stand out from the rest and relate in a more intrinsic way to his Gentile mission, apostle, servant, prophet, priest, and herald. And the five are Paul's self-descriptions, whether explicitly or implicitly. And I think they overlap in various ways. All of them have roots in the Jewish scriptures. And most significantly for our purposes, arguably, they define and give impetus to his Gentile mission. So I'll move through them uh, pretty quickly. Now, the first one's the, the, the most obvious one, Paul's call to be an apostle. The language of calling itself uh, is significant to describe his commission. Uh, the Old Testament in Greek regularly uses the concept of calling to refer to a granting of a task by God. Um, Abraham to be the father of a nation, uh, Cyrus of Persia as an agent of providence, Israel as a light to the Gentiles. And I think Paul conceives of his call to apostleship as obviously granting him a specific task in terms of his Gentile mission. The overall goal of Paul's apostolic activity is um, a big question. I think Paul sees the final end of uh, the mighty salvation historical drama in which he is caught up to be the glory of God. And that's a theme I'll return to a few times in the paper. Um, I think it's key for Paul's mission. Uh, the glory of God is of fundamental importance for his mission. It's right throughout the Jewish scriptures as a major theme. It's tied to historical events and it's historically rich. Uh, the point at this stage I want to make is that the glory of God necessarily involves the removal of all idol worship. And I think significantly for Paul's mission, as part of the is Israel's destiny, the prophets and the psalmists speak of the nations abandoning their idols and worshipping God with lavish praise and glory in places like Psalm 66, 138, Habakkuk 2.14 and some other prophets. Uh, with respect to Paul's appropriation of this theme, I think Richard Hayes is helpful when he says that Isaiah offers the clearest expression in the Old Testament of a universalistic eschatological vision in which the restoration of Israel in Zion is accompanied by an ingathering of Gentiles to worship the Lord. Uh, this is something we've touched on already several times, and I'll return to Isaiah 66 in a moment. So that's called to be an apostle. A few thoughts on servant of the Lord. Uh, Paul describes himself in Romans 1, 1 and other places as uh, doulos Christu theu. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, doulos Christu Jesu. And uh, um, I think a good case, very briefly, uh, can be made to say that Paul's drawing on the scriptural figure of the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 40 to uh, 55. Uh, and this servant has a special role with the nation. So in Isaiah 49, it says, you are my servant, and in you I will be glorified. There's the glory theme again. Behold, I have made you a light for the nations, that my salvation might extend to the end of the earth. Lionel Windsor's book from a few years ago lays out the evidence, I think, quite convincingly for Paul's identification with the Isaiahic servant in Romans. Um, soon after his self-description in 1 1, he says in the following verses that his gospel's firmly set in the prophetic scriptures. Isaiah's the most important book in Romans in terms of uh, um, uh, the use of scripture in, in the letter. And arguably, uh, Paul links his ministry in a number of other places with the Isaiahic servant in Galatians, uh, 2 Corinthians and Philippians. Thirdly, uh, prophet of God, uh, Joshua Jip and Murray Smith, um, happily from my perspective, identified Paul as an apostle, uh, as a prophet of God in the book of Acts when they gave their papers a couple of days ago, you'll remember. And I, I would just want to build on that and say that in Paul's own letters too, there's good evidence that even though he never calls himself a prophet, 
there's uh, it, it's critical for his identity, his self understanding. Uh, Jeffrey Annie's study of the evidence in 2 Corinthians concludes that Ezekiel's prophetic discourse provides one of the foundations on which Paul is able to develop his apostolic rhetoric and describe his, pers his persona. Um, I've got others in the paper who've said similar things. A fourth self-description I want to point out is priest, priest of God's good news. Jörg's paper the other day mentioned this in passing. And uh, Romans 15, 15 to 16 is a famous couple of verses I'm sure you're aware of, where Paul describes his priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Spirit. So the, the verses uh, in Paul's description of his raison d'etre uh, just drip with cultic terminology. I think Malachi 1.11 is an important text here. Where, Paul, uh, where the prophet says that God's name will be glorified among the nations from the rising of the sun to the setting. In every place, his incense and pure offerings will be brought to my name because my name will be glorified among the nations. And that little phrase, in every place, turns up four times in the Pauline corpus in these kind of contexts to describe the uh, worldwide mission that Paul sees himself engaged in as a priest. Um, Philo is interesting here. He, he has a couple of passages I've found where he talks about the priestly service for the sake of non-Jews. So in, on the special laws and in, uh, um, on Abraham, you've got text saying things like an offering both for the nation and also a common one for the whole race of mankind so that the people by it will worship the living God. Now, obviously, there is a difference because for Paul, the Gentiles are the offering, uh, but in Philo, uh, the offering is being made for the Gentiles. Uh, Isaiah, coming to Isaiah 66, I'd recommend the work of James Scott and Rainer Riesner, um, both of whom connect uh, the, the, uh, Paul's use of Isaiah 66 in Romans 15 in terms of the table of nations back in Genesis 10. So um, uh, just briefly, uh, Reasoner argues that Paul read this text as being fulfilled in his own activity and traces of this exegesis stand behind Romans 15, 16 to 24. Um, so I, I won't say anything more there, but we've mentioned Isaiah 66 a few times already. I think it is a key text for Paul. Fifthly, Gospel Herald, I think, is a neglected category of Paul's self-understanding that's quite helpful. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, Paul says that Christ sent him to preach the gospel, uh, euangelizo, and the euangel terminology is uh, at several key places in Paul's letters. Uh, in Isaiah 52, um, which Paul quotes in Romans 10, 15, it says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, using that language in the LXX, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. And arguably, Paul's use of euangel terminology is indebted to several passages in Isaiah, whereas John Dixon has pointed out secular messenger language is transposed to a higher eschatological level, depicting the end-time herald commissioned by Israel's God to announce his salvific reign. Uh, Peter Sturmacher uh, some time ago made similar points where he said that Paul's gospel heralding is an eschatological, divinely commissioned activity, drawing on the background of Isaiah once again. So the eschatological heralds are less, less, uh, less well-known uh, way of describing Paul's identity, but it turns out, I think, to be a key ingredient in understanding his agenda as an apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll move on. Um, the second thing I want us to consider, having thought about Paul's self-identification, his self-understanding, is the question of Paul and the pillars of Judaism. So here I'm wondering, has Paul abandoned the central beliefs and symbols of Judaism? Now, Judaism, of course, uh, just speaking of Judaism with a singular raises hackles, and I can see the temperature rising around the room. Um, but I, I think all, all I'm really saying here, and I admit, a variety, of course, in ancient 
um, expressions of being Jewish. I'm not even sure if I can use the word Judaism anymore. Um, it is that it, given the richness and diversity in, of Jewish belief and practice, there were still some fundamental beliefs and symbols and practices that held uh, the ancient religion together. So clearly, Philo of Alexandria, the Pharisees and the Gospels, the Qumran teacher of righteousness have very little in common on one level, but on another level, they still held to what we might call the pillars of Judaism. And here I have in mind things like election, Torah, temple, land, Shema. Um, and it reminds me of Acts 21 when Paul arrived in Jerusalem on his third missionary journey. He's greeted with the charge that he was teaching against our people, our law, this place. So there you have three core beliefs, our people, election, our law, Torah, and this place, the temple. So in the paper, I make the obvious point that you can find in Paul's letters some very negative things about these three things, um, where Paul says in Romans that uh, not all descended from Israel are Israel, uh, redefining or some would say rejecting election. Uh, Paul says some very negative things about the law of Moses. And uh, although he never explicitly rejects the Jewish temple and its priesthood and sacrifices, he implies as much by using cultic terminology for something else. I think the, the thing to do here is to, is to ask, what does a smaller group do with the, the symbols of the mother group when it begins to break away? And I think the Essenes at Qumran are an interesting analogy. Uh, the sectarian documents of the Dead Sea Scrolls indicate that the sectaries did not abolish, but rather reconfigured the pillars of Judaism. They denied the validity of the Jerusalem temple and priesthood. But they asserted their own new order, spiritualized dwelling place of God. They asserted their own superior, uh, superior interpretation of Torah and even supplemented it. And they redefined the scope of election of the nation, replacing it with a new def definition of the sons of light and the sons of darkness. So I think that's the way I would read Paul as well. He doesn't reject the symbols of uh, the pillars, if you like, of the mother faith, but rather reconfigures them. So he reconfigures them in this sense. So in Romans, for example, believers are identified, believers in Christ, as the new people of God, the elect called beloved saints, children of Abraham, true circumcision. Um, as I've argued in my book, Paul and the Law, Paul rejects the law, but only as law, covenant and legal code. He reappropriates it as prophecy of the gospel and as wisdom for living. And as regards the temple, as we've already seen, he sees his own work as priestly and as uh, heaps, to use an Australian expression, of uh, cultic terminology, uh, mercy seat, uh, living sacrifices, priestly service, and so on. So even if Paul seems to depart from Judaism with respect to its core beliefs, a closer look indicates that he remains within Judaism in that he reinterprets rather than rejects its distinctives. And then finally, uh, I want to think about Paul's agenda and strategy um, with respect to his work as an apostle, um, to use Paula's question perhaps on this morning, what, what, what is Paul asking of the ethne in Christ would be the question. And I think here we find um, two things. The content of what he teaches Gentiles and cleaning them up, if you like, is very Jewish. And even his strategy is quite Jewish. So content Peter Borgen notes that the vice lists of Galatians 5 and 1 Corinthians 6, which contrast pagan and Christian lifestyles, have just two sins in common. So sexual immorality and idolatry, those two things are very important for Paul. Um, another book by Carl Wilhelm Niebuhr some time ago just points out that in, in Hellenistic Jewish Paranesis, there's a discussion of sexual deviation, such as incest, homosexuality in connection with sexual relations in marriage in close proximity. We see that in Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 to 7 and other places. So he says, don't do this, but rather do this. Um, it's a very Jewish way of addressing those issues. Uh, there are plenty of Jewish texts we could cite. The Sibylite oracles have sexual immorality and idolatry as primary points 
of uh, moral norms with which they're concerned. William Loder's study of the interpretation of the Decalogue is interesting, I think, on this score. Um, many Jews elevated the prohibition of adultery above murder, such that idolatry and adultery were the first and uh, headed the first and second tables of the Ten Words. So Paul's moral sensibilities remain thoroughly Jewish. I think, too, Paul's strategy or approach is very Jewish. Uh, in another um, essay by uh, Jörg, he points out that 1 Thess 1, 9 and 10 uh, shows Paul's familiarity with motifs and forms of Hellenistic Jewish preaching. So that famous text where Paul kind of sums up his the nature of Gentile conversion. They turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom uh, he raised from the dead. So here you see a rejection of idolatry and a waiting for God's son from heaven. And uh, I'm running out of time, so I won't go longer. But I think you can find this same pattern in many of Paul's letters and also in at least three that I've found um, of uh, uh, early Jewish moral teaching. Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs have similar patterns where idolatry, uh, sexual immorality, and uh, um, waiting for the age to come are the, really the framing of the moral discourse. So to conclude, does Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles from Israel, uphold his Jewish identity? Uh, I think Paul himself uh, saw that he was a Jew who believed that Jesus of Nazareth, Israel's long-awaited Messiah, had called him to the Jewish roles of servant, prophet, and priest to perform the task of heralding the gospel to the nations. Uh, in my understanding, he continued to hold to the central beliefs of Judaism, including the law, election, and temple, albeit in a reconfigured form. And he undertook his Gentile mission in ways that are recognizably Jewish. Excellent. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, yeah, golf, golfers clap for you. Not just because you're my boss, because it was a good paper. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, Ryan, I can hand over to you. Uh, uh, mate, do you, do you have any questions or comments for Brian before we open it up wider? Sure. Um, first of all, I, I want to thank Brian for a, a very, very brilliant paper and so clear in, ex, in its expose and, and also the summary today. So it's very, very nice. And I agree with, I think, most of what you said, but I'd like a bit of clarification about one particular aspect which I don't think that you have that you could that you have uh, touched on it much, and uh, I'm wondering if you could touch on the Shema. Um, uh, how does Paul reconfigure the Shema monotheism within his own uh, reconfiguration of his um, Jewish um, ancestral traditions? Okay, thanks, Ronald. Um, yes, as, as you know, in the paper, I deal very briefly with three of the main pillars of Judaism, the Torah, the temple, and election. I think the Shema, 1, 1 Corinthians 8, 5 and 6, is often pointed out that uh, Paul seems to include, and um, it, it's, uh, it, it sounds anachronistic to say, but it's pretty well true, he includes Jesus Christ in the identity of God. Uh, there's one God, one Father. And, uh, and, and all things are created through, um, the, um, through one Lord, Jesus Christ. So the three words from the Shema, one God and Lord, are reconfigured in... I've lost. Oh, no. Brian, Brian, I don't know whether you can hear us, but at your most climactic point, um, you... <laughs> We lost you at your most climactic point. Actually, I think you may have gone off. I think we've like completely lost Brian. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know. Well, g given what's happened in Melbourne recently, I wouldn't be surprised if he's been raptured, to be perfectly oh. honest. <laughs> My, Mike, this is what you've been waiting for. It's stand-up comedy time until he comes back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know oh, you're I could. for this. You know, you know, let me just get at my, um, my uh, top 10 minutes. On the bottom, I I bet that's Brian now. 
Did you make it? Did you make it back, Brian? We have to wait for his parousia. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'll see if we can see him coming back on some clouds. That would be that would be even better. Can you get him on your telephone? <laughs> yeah. Well, we might have. We, we have to tell him we need closure. We need to know what that dramatic point was. He, was about, he looked like he was about to say something very important. Yes, and then he was elevated at that point. Yeah, yes. <laughs> in a platonic way. Yes. So, I think it must be right. Absolutely. Well, certain things are me meant to stay a mystery. So I'm sure he's. I'm sure he's <laughs> trying to get back in. Um, I might, I might text him. Ah, oh, here he is a bit. Yep, there he is. And yeah, he's coming back. Yes, I'm coming back. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. We thought you were about to say something very, very um, <laughs> poignant and dramatic, and you got you got raptured. Which, given the climate of Victoria, would not be all that um, um, surprising. Yeah, I'm so sorry, friends. It's very frustrating. Now, can you hear me? We can. Yes. 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 So uh, Ronald asked, as I was trying to respond to, um, does Paul, what does Paul do with the Shema? And I pointed out that in 1 Corinthians 8, 5 and 6, he picks up the three main words from the Shema, uh, namely uh, God, Lord and one, and seems to include Jesus Christ in the very identity of God, which is an extraordinary Christological moment. Um, but, but I do think there is evidence that even the Shema which at face value might seem to put Paul outside Judaism, is reconfigured within Paul's understanding of, of the Christ movement. So would you say that what he's doing is still very Jewish of including a, a Jesus within the Godhead? Um, I think he thinks it's Jewish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, uh, so... Um, my, my paper's attempting to look at uh, Paul's Jewishness from his own point of view. And yes, I, I think he would say it, it's, it's thoroughly Jewish. I mean, the development of Christology and the early understanding of the church in terms of the deity of Christ is obviously an enormous area and very complicated. Uh, sure. But just on, on, on the question of Paul's use of the Shema, he does seem to embrace that central Jewish tenet and include Jesus Christ within the definition of God. Hmm. Can you see me, by the way? No. I don't know what's happening. Anyway. It gives your voice even greater authority. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paula. It's very kind. I think we can now open it to wider questions. If anyone has uh, anything else they want to ask of Brian. Yep, go ahead, Paula. Um, thank you, uh, Brian. On your uh, issue of uh, Paul as, as a prophet, um, he also makes prophets of his ethne, right? Prophecy is one of the things that their, um, the spirit enables them to do. Yes. Um, um, the, t the link that you made with um, Isaiah and uh, um, the, the speaker for the, the spokesperson of the Evangelion. Um, but prophecy itself seems to be a marker, I think, of all of his communities. So um, I, just a thought that I had as I, um, as I looked at this paragraph. That's no, a good thought. Thanks, Paula. Uh, I haven't really thought through much further than uh, what you've just said. Uh, there is debate, of course, about the status of New Testament prophecy or prophecy in Paul's hands, whether it's uh, entirely equivalent with Old Testament prophecy with, with Paul's, uh, with the Jewish prophets. Um, it, it seems to have less authority than the Jewish prophets because uh, uh, false prophecy in the Jewish scriptures resulted in uh, execution, whereas you would to discern the prophets uh, in the New Testament period, and even in Acts, you see that happening where prophets say something and sometimes Paul doesn't follow their advice. 
So, uh, yes, I think it's an interesting observation and I'd have to think further how it relates to the Jewishness of uh, Paul himself and his communities. Right. Any other questions for Brian? Um, Go ahead, Michael. I just in, in light of this paper and other papers, I wonder if um, the category of family of Abraham might be kind of useful over, instead of thinking Paul reconfiguring Israel to include Gentiles to say uh, Jews or Israel and Gentiles retain their ethnic distinction while um, being part of this larger overarching category, which is also ethnic. So we don't fall into the new perspective, universalism versus ethnocentrism dichotomy that Paul's think, still thinking of a group, but the group is that family of Abraham that incorporate, well, Jews as the natural heirs and Gentiles in Christ through Numa being adopted into that, that, that might be the best category to work with in terms of the group he's think, imagining. Yeah, the, the status of the Christ believers vis-a-vis -vis Israel seems to be a continuing theme throughout our conference. And what you've just described makes sense in Romans 9 to 11. Uh, but I still come back to one, a passage like 1 Corinthians 10, which seems to distinguish what Paul calls the church of God from both Jews and Gentiles. So, um, yeah, I, I'm still a work in progress on thinking through some of those issues. Any other questions? Um, could I say something about sexual profligacy, please? Go ahead, um, Paula. Um, that uh, I'm thinking of Je uh, Jennifer Knuss's book, Abandoned to Lust. And I'm also thinking of uh, Ben Isaac's uh, big book on the invention of racism in uh, classical antiquity. Um, accusations, uh, inter-ethnic accusations of um, sexual profligacy is, is common coin. Um, and what makes it specifically... Um, so that is, that's what you say when you don't like a certain people, they sleep with their mothers or you, they are also, you know, they eat people. That's not nice either. And, uh, sorts of stuff. I think what's specifically, um, idiosyncratically Jewish as you, as you bring out is not the rant against sexual profligacy because everybody's saying that about everybody else, um, which makes some of these texts more fun to read. Uh, but it's the it's the idol worship that is um, idiosyncratically Jewish. Okay, yeah, that that's helpful. Thanks, Paula. Yeah, I think uh, Jews generally thought that Gentiles were idolatrous, sexually immoral. The other one is greed, of course, crops up very often that uh, um, that they were um, um, uh, greedy and not generous with their possessions. And I think it's interesting in the second century you find. Um, the distinctives of the early Christian movement were often in these terms, that they, uh, that they worshipped one God and uh, that they were sexually chaste and pure and also that they shared their possessions. So in the better moments, the early church, that was true of them. But, but I think that's very interesting. I, I'd, I'd like to follow that up. So really the, the biggest distinctive is the one from 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10 for Gentile conversion namely uh, turning to the living God and uh, perhaps the accusations of porneia and like and the like um, are less of a distinctive. I have to think that through. So thank you for the thoughts and the uh, recommendations for reading. I think Josh Jip has a question. Yeah, I have a question. I'll also just say that Michael's question and comment is one that I'm also res wrestling with. Uh, so if we get a chance at some point, uh, and further discussion later on, that's, um, I, I thought was a relevant and helpful question. But my, my question for Brian, on page nine, you say, um, did Paul teach against the pillars of Judaism? The charge seems to stick. And uh, one of the examples you give is that Paul never explicitly rejects the Jewish temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices, but you say that he implies as much in his use of cultic, cultic imagery to refer to something else. I have a few different, there, there's a few different questions that raises for me. One is, um, does, is, is the Luke and Paul sort of wrong then in Acts 20, 21 and following, or is Luke's presentation of him uh, wrong? Um, 
or is it possible that by devout is it possible that paul still did his nazaritic vow he still you know could claim authentically to be faithful to the ancestral customs his ancestral customs but he um uh believed that the numa created sort of this holiness and cult you know uh in in a way that went beyond that that as you say it implied its deva- devaluation so that's that, that's uh, you know i'm wrestling to make sense with sort of the representation of what you say about paul and the luke and paul and whether sometimes it's not as simple as a matter of was he obedient disobedient did he believe it not believe it but there are matters are there matters of importance in terms of how he uh worked that out so i hope that i hope that question makes sense brian well, it's more of uh, food for thought than a question, I guess. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think it reminds me of 1 Corinthians 9, which we had the other day, of course, uh, 19 to 23, where uh, whether we're talking about Paul's adaptability in certain contexts, and I do think Paul has a different approach to obedience to the law for um uh, believers in Christ from a Jewish background than than others. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't have a lot more to say. And, and thanks for your comments. And you know, I'll I'll try and take them on board and think them through. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, unless we have any other questions, I think I'll probably hand over. Oh, we do have a question. Is that from Murray? You got a question, Murray? Yeah, thank, thanks. I'm, I'm clapping as well, but I really did want to ask a question, <laughs> uh, which is just about the lang- around the language of reconfiguring Judaism. I think I used it myself in my paper, but I'm still struggling to find the right uh, word for this because I think if you ask Paul, he would say he's not reconfiguring anything. Uh, he's, he's just announcing that what God promised beforehand has, has taken place. The circumcision in the heart, it's already there in Deuteronomy and Jeremiah. Uh, the principle of faith, it's already there in Genesis. So, so Paul would say, I'm, I'm not reconfiguring, I'm not reinterpreting, I'm announcing the eschatological fulfillment of what was promised beforehand. Uh, so I, um, I guess I'm just putting that out there in the mix and, and wondering how do we, finding way, finding, have you found good ways of talking about this, um, what's new uh, in the way that Paul is um, uh, presenting uh, you know, the, 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 his uh, Jewish heritage and, and what's consistent. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Murray. Um, it, 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 I think you're right. Reconfiguring is something Paul probably wouldn't have accepted as a description of what he's doing. I think the language of newness is quite helpful. So new creation, um, uh, uh, the uh, the new covenant. So So there is something that is discontinuous with what, Paul believed and understood as um, before Damascus Road. So that we've got to have, find some way of describing those changes that are consistent with his own language. Um, and, and probably reconfiguring is, is more an uh, imposition. And uh, in the end, it might be unhelpful. Yeah, Paul was going to say something, I think. And I just... Just very quickly, the the point about temple, he wouldn't be using temple language unless he thought the temple were important. Mm. Right. So saying that the ecclesia is so spirit filled that it's also a temple. It doesn't have to be um, a zero sum game. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I agree with that for most of Paul's letters, but very occasionally, 1 Corinthians 3 16, 6 20, he, he does say, that you are the temple. And that does seem to be quite polemical. And it's quite an audacious claim, isn't it? That this ragbag, filthy, mainly Gentile congregation of Christ believers can be compared to the temple. And I I think it's, again, there, it's not just a, uh, you're the temple, that's not the temple. It's you're the fulfillment of Solomon's temple. So I think there's a sense in which uh, there's a, um, uh, fulfillment theme, um, uh, as well as um, w- one which could be read as polemical. But uh, I, I agree with you, Paul. But I, but I'm not sure that that's always the case. In in First Corinthians three, they are a temple, 
not the temple. Okay, yeah, good point. Yep. Same. Joshua, uh, Garraway, I think you've got a question or a comment as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, very quickly. Um, I, I, I like what, I think it was Murray, it was someone in the top left, but I think the top left <laughs> might have changed. Um, <laughs> saying how, uh, you know, we've seen the word, um, well, I used reinscription, we've seen relativization, uh, reconfiguration. And the question I have, which I think is a tomorrow question, but I'll put it out there now, is how do we determine when these words, whatever we use, reconfiguration, um, blends over into rejection? Because it seems to me we could ask the question, we could have a new school called Justin Martyr within Judaism. Well, you know, he reconfigures Torah, he reconfigures covenant, he reconfigures election, he reconfigures temple, he reconfigures Israelite identity, and yet that doesn't seem to make any sense to us. I mean, we could Augustine within Judaism, um, and yet for some reason Paul within Judaism is a thing, even though I'm not sure what he's ultimately doing is that much different from what some of these later figures are doing. So I would like a, a bigger, broader discussion about the relationship between reconfiguration and rejection. Uh, uh, yeah. Yep. Just throwing in, just to confuse things further, uh, in my book on Paul and the law, I argue that Paul rejects the law, he replaces the law, and then he reappropriates the law. So <laughs> it, uh, that is the challenge and i think uh, i've always we, wondered if we, we should just think of christianity within judaism and once you do that then a lot of these problems are solved that if you're mm. always anything you're talking about related to christianity is within some larger umbrella of judaism then maybe the question of paul within judaism no longer becomes all that salutary and, and this may touch on uh, the discussion of the families of abraham which other people have, have expressed interest in. So uh, that'll wait till tomorrow, I assume. Thanks. Indeed. Well, well, thank you very much for that, Brian. Uh, that was, that was great. Uh, next I'll hand over to uh, Ron and uh, his presentation. So uh, you have the floor, Ron. Hey, thank you. So um, the question that I'm interested in is what did Paul think he was doing? And when we look at Paul, we are looking at, a particular scholarly construction, and we are also looking at a particular scripturalized construction. We're looking at a particular argument. We're looking at a particular way that Paul is presenting himself. And I think that um, some of you in your own papers, you, 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 you mentioned that, that, you know, Paul, he is within a particular argumentative mode. So, and, and I think that's important. And I also think that we need to think about um, some of the terms that we use, we scholars, we use them for our own way of analyzing them um, or making a particular argument ourselves. Um, so I think that, that that's important uh, to, 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 to point out. So I'm probing how Paul is textualized and how he views his, uh, role or what he's doing vis-a-vis um, -vis his own ancestral traditions. And the second thing that I, I touched upon is um, Paul and uh, the new creation language. So he is thinking that he is going elsewhere to talk to those who are non-Jews and creating with them a new creation or a new humanity uh, shaped we, uh, that is included within the Abrahamic uh, story. And he understands what he's doing as a kind of a call, um, Galatian one, Galatians 1, 1, not from men, nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father to the communities. Okay, so that's what he does. And I'm trying to then understand how does, what does he think he's doing? Um, um, with regard to his own ancestral traditions. So he is within that, and he is still functioning within the basic ethnic Abrahamic story of God's calling a particular group um, forth to inherit the whole world. And in reaching out to the nations with his message about the death and resurrection of Christ, his vision embraces the whole universe as being under the Jewish understanding of the world. 
this vision of the God of Israel modified with Jesus in the Godhead invading and reigning over the world is for Paul what brings the nations and by extension Israel to God. So for Paul now is the urgent time to help God keep God's promises to Israel. And his mission to the nations is the way to achieve that very goal. So, and he does not think that we can divorce the Gentiles' future from the Jewish uh, future. So they are linked. And we see that also in, in, in Romans, what he's doing in Romans, especially Romans 9 to 11. Um, so Paul thinks that he had to go to the nations, to the people of, uh, who are not within that particular Abrahamic uh, narrative in order to secure peace and stability among the nations for the nation's own good. And in that way to provoke Israel to jealousy in order for Israel to turn back to God. And this ideology dreams of rescuing the nations, which are one recalls identified by Paul and his kinsmen as sinful sinners, less pure, less self-controlled than the Jews, and of enticing them to forge a commitment with the God of Israel via faith in the resurrected Christ. So what I try to do then is to place uh, this kind of, of, of movement of Paul going to the nations within uh, the, the Roman imperial order and see what Paul is doing here and see, uh, look at some of the complexities of what he's engaging in. So, um, so this is the first half. And, 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 and then here, Paul, he imagines himself as being a called one, as being one going to the nations and to preach about a life, death, and resurrection of a Jewish uh, person to those who are under um, the Ro Roman imperial power. So he imagines himself um, presenting a uh, this kind of Christological monotheism, and we can say more about that. And we cannot, of course, understanding what he's doing without examining his Jewish roots and how this, um, how this not only influence, but inform his own theologizing exercises. He uses strategies readily available in his intellectual collection to make his presentation of Christ. All that is of interest to him is to present Israel God to the nations via Christ as the supreme God while castigating the gods of the nations as subordinates or subservient to the Jewish God. One needs to place Paul within his Jewish milieu and highlight his activities and letters in the context of one who lived his life in proximity to fellow Jews, to the God of, God of Israel, to the gods of the ethne, and one who negotiated the social realities of the larger Greco-Roman world. So the next point is about Paul's political identity. And here, this is where I mentioned um, the creation in Paul's understanding of new creation communities, where there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female under Christ, Galatians 3, 28. Paul uses his mission to the Gentiles as a way to provoke to jealousy his fellow um, um, compatriots, and as a way also to ingather the nations into Israel's fold. The genealogical construct that places Abraham as the father of all the nations aimed to set the nations as belonging, strangely not to the Roman Empire, but to Israel, 
and to Israel's narrative. Although um, Paul reformats or reconfigures um, uh, Israel's story to fit his grand theological vision of a new humanity attached to and under Christ. Paul makes a shift from the reality of displaced bodies, including his own, to controlling the bodies of under his own authority with respect to satisfying um, some kind of, 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 of hierarchical order as well. Um, he is indeed among the defeated uh, nations and he portrays himself as one who is also defeated. His body bears the marks of the empire and his audience is composed of defeated peoples. He, however, seems to have wanted to establish a new creation with a new lordship that is not that similar to the one portrayed by Rome. Paul presents himself as one called by Israel God to all the nations in order to present to them a new identity and a new politics of identity, a new lordship, namely that of Christ. Paul seems to be imagining an alternative world which is still defined by the old genealogical boundaries of insiders and outsiders, where all the non-Jews are thus flattened into a sameness, regardless of their self-constructed ethnicity, for no other reason that they are different from insiders, the Jews. His former expression of Judaism in which he exceeded excessively persecuted the burgeoning Jewish sect of Christ's followers, is now replaced by becoming part of the movement he once tried to destroy and by advocating a radically altered version of his Jewishness to the scattered peoples of the nations. In other words, his goal of defending his ethnic privilege has not changed, but has been recalibrated, reoriented, refixated, and all refocused. He's still deeply steeped in his binary, binary way of understanding the world, of understanding the world as us and them. If the previous us was too rigid and too narrow in its understanding because it was based on nationalistic privileges and identity markers, now in light of the revelation of Christ in him, it needs to open up to include others. Paul imagines his recalibrated ethnic identity on top of any other identities. He represents himself as an arch soldier, divinely ordained by the general, the curious Christ, to bring about the obedience of faith among all the ethnic. Even if one could argue that Paul was somewhat different and to some extent less of a violent man after his vision, of a risen Christ than he pre previously was, one surely detects that there are vestiges of violence in Paul's language and attitudes towards the ethnically other. In this, in this sense, Paul, instead of presenting an alternative to uh, the ideology and power structure of Rome, merely repro repro reproduces with Christ, killed by Rome and raised to life by God, another powerful figure himself indicated by Israel's deity. So I'm trying to complicate uh, the picture of Paul here by, by showing how, how things are, um, especially looking at it from a post-colonial perspective and looking at Rome as, uh, as an imperial um, place. So um, as, as a way of concluding, um, Paul, he works amongst the ethne, and he's trying to establish um, new creation communities amongst uh, the ethne. And he is um, preaching um, a, a message that is Jewish in so many ways. And he is one that is trying to form these communities, but he is doing all of that in order to... Um, to push his own people to accept um, uh, their, how could I put it uh, in, in a clear way, that he's, he's to, to, to provoke uh, Israel to jealousy. So uh, probing Paul's identity politics reveal how um, 
enmeshed um, his construct construction of identity can be. Um, reading this way, of course, is a challenge that complicates greatly the power dynamics in Paul's letters in a way that could help to problematize the text as it also nuances our understanding of Paul among the nations. And here, anyone trying to understand Paul and trying to understand what did he think he was doing needs to understand that he lived in urgency, that he contemplated an imminent eschatology, his engagement with Judaism, with the Torah, circumcision, and other aspects of his ancestral traditions are key to make sense of what he may have thought he was doing. I hope I have given a brief, very brief sense of how Paul lived his life entirely within his native Judaism, although an existent recalibrated around Christ, while pointing out that his identity cannot be divorced from his apostolic mission as an apostle to the ethnic. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ron. That was great. Uh, Ron, what was that string of phrases? You had like a string of about three R words. I think you had like reappropriated, retooled, re revised. Oh, yes. Uh, that, 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 that was recalibrated, reoriented, refixated, refocused. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think that was, um, that kind of dovetails a little bit with what Brian was doing in his recalibration. That kind of, like, yeah. my, my ears <laughs> picked up. That's, 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 a, that's a good alliteration you've got going on there. Um, <laughs> But anyway, Brian, I'll, I'll hand, hand back to you if you have any uh, questions or comments on Ron's paper. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks so much, Ronald. Um, yeah, I, li I like the paper. It's, uh, it's a fresh presentation on the, the simple question, what did Paul think he was doing, which is really uh, the focus of our conference. I think the language of newness, as I mentioned a few moments ago, is quite helpful. And I think one of the dangers... Uh, with the Paul within Judaism movement and what we're learning from it and so on is um, downplaying the discontinuity uh, with Judaism. So Paul does think in terms of newness of life, Romans 6, 4, new covenant, 1 and 2 Corinthians, both places, new humanity you get in Ephesians, um, serving God in a new way of the spirit, Romans 7. So there is a newness that I think, and I think you're right to point to new creation as a key concept for understanding Paul. And I agree with Mike, it's great to see so many more rewords. <laughs> Recalibrated was my favorite, just out of interest. I, I have just one question at this stage. So I think you helpfully try and situate Paul's mission within the uh, Roman world and uh, um, on page five, though, you say Paul does not present an alternative to the ideology and power structure of Rome. Yeah. And at another point, you say that Paul was attempting to create countercultural values, subversive ones within alternative communities. And I just wonder whether the, the, the previous statement that Paul does not present an alternative to the ideology and power structure of Rome is accurate. I, I would put it, I, I would just say the opposite. I, I would say Paul. Yeah, yeah. no, I think you're alternative. right. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think you're right. I need to uh, rephrase that. Um, but but what, I, what, what I had in mind was that you have, um, Paul is, he's, he is presenting Christ as a new kind of, 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 of big figure, right? But he's still within that presentation of big figure. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say, but I did not express this well. And, and that was a paper written in a very rush because I'm in the midst of, of packing boxes and it's, it's, it's crazy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so I think um, it, it's helpful perhaps to think of the apocalyptic theology of the cross in the opening yeah. chapters of 1 Corinthians where yeah. the values of the world really are turned upside down. The fact that yeah. God saved the world, according to Paul, through a shameful execution means that God has outsmarted the wisdom of the world and overpowered through weakness the strength of the world. And then the social implications of that way in which he saved the world are played out right throughout the letter in terms of, uh, um, just to use a modern term, inclusion, uh, because mm. God chose the weak 
and, and humility and uh, all, all that kind of stuff. The, the whole business of love comes from Paul's understanding of the apocalyptic theology of the cross, I think. So, yeah, so that, that was my main quibble. Thank and you. it's nice to hear that you, you've uh, seen that as something that could be clarified and developed further. Definitely. So thank you very much. Thank you. We can open up for any uh, further questions or wider questions from our um, attendees. So if anyone's got a uh, question, uh, raise your hand. I right, say, so, yeah, Yoga, if you got a, 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 you can feel free to chime in with your question, Yoga. Uh, yes, uh, Ram, thank you for your very interesting perspectives. Um, when you when you address that, um, well, power play, uh, power and weakness, um, or uh, representing power and representing weakness at the same point, isn't that in in some way also in in Paul's uh, view a kind of imitation of of what is in Christ? So in uh, in in the image of Christ, of course, we have that uh, the crucified one and the one who is uh, enthroned so this uh, double situation of course we would we would imagine we would like perhaps uh, he he might take a, a more precise and more um, definite stance uh, on one side um, but that's that's the the uh, diverse the the ambiguity or the the paradoxy uh, which is uh, set with with Christ and with the image of Christ uh, in general what do, you, what do you think? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so when you when you read, for example, the literature in postcolonial studies, you you learn of the ambiguity. You learn of imitation, the imitation in language, imitation of acts. That is, when you have one who is a subaltern, there is a kind of wanting to get read of a, a particular power, but by but using also some of the language or, or some of the tools of the power to dismantle the power. But 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 what when you do that, and I remember reading Professor Avril Cameron, um, a, a book she wrote in the 1990s, um, it's the rhetoric of empire. When you use the rhetoric of the rhetoric of empire, what happens is that what you are saying enters into a particular mode of empire as well, and 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 then you tend yourself to become um, what you are rejecting. So Paul he is using some of the language of of, of empire, and there is and there is the the power play, there is the power dynamic. Uh, and, 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 and sometimes you feel that Paul is talking, as you said, both language of weakness or, and of strength, of authority and also of, of humility, of a, being against, but also somewhat pro. So this is this ambiguity, this is this a complexity of language that I wanted to, to, to explore and to out and and to help us understand that when Paul goes to the to the nations he goes within a particular social and political realities and he is using language and is using ways um, as he goes to them he's using of course his own um, his own culture and his own uh, Abrahamic narrative but he's also within a larger political structure that we need to pay attention to. Thanks. I think we had another question from Mark. Yes, thank you. Um, I think this is a wonderful corrective. And I think we almost need to hear it like every time we do anything. Um, it, it, it's, just, it's just a truth. And uh, it's true about Judaism. It's true about Christianity. It's true about Islam. It's true about Buddhism. Is true about Americans, is true about Koreans. Uh, I don't care who you talk about. Um, we, we, uh, we might idealize, right, uh, weakness and humility. But in fact, if, especially if we're, we're given the charge of a group of people, uh, 
uh, <laughs> we make the same mistakes everyone else makes. Uh, that's the dynamics of power. And I, so I really, really appreciate it. One of the things I think that is interesting about it, I wanted to bring up, see what you thought is, when we talk about Paul within Judaism practice, you know, if he's carrying out uh, and thinking as a Jewish figure, he's actually nested in a, uh, a, a sub-colonial he, he's the colonized as a Jew uh, uh, and, and Judaism in the Roman world. And um, like the prophets, but also I think others of his time are, uh, you know, I'm thinking of, um, what's the book? Uh, uh, oh, I forget the name, but um, Goodman wrote a long time ago about the Judean Judeans. Um, most Jews and Judeans are probably pretty unhappy with Jewish leadership to the degree that it's complicit with the Romans. The interesting thing about Paul is that he is into this minority groups in the diaspora, minority communities, let's say, let's say there's 100 Jews, 10,000 non-Jews, and now he starts a group with like 10, of which seven are from the majority 10,000 culture. And they're nested now in a subgroup identity as the support as the outsiders suddenly in the Jewish group. And that's part of what his letters, I think, are about is how do they fit in? Because, I mean, they were the majority. They were the, the big guys. Now they're suddenly uh, the little guys. I've actually found Messianic, studying Messianic Judaism, modern Messianic Judaism, kind of interesting in the same way. Because these Gentile Christians come in and they got Jewish leaders and Jewish stuff they don't know. And they're kind of have to kind of reorient, you know, because Christians were on top and Jews were on the bottom. I mean, let's, everybody knows that. But uh, so I wonder what you think about that in terms of as you're constructing this, uh, this impulse that you have, uh, you know, Paul the hero needs to be popped a little bit, as do any hero. Um, yes. But I wonder what you think about how, how that is constructed within this situation that his non-Jews are in. Exactly. I, and, and I think this is where we need to be extremely careful and look at each situation um, closely. Because, because many times Paul is presenting himself as this, um, uh, as this one who knows God and he has um, a lot to offer you. You don't know. He, is, he knows God. He has, uh, he has been called. So he, mm -hmm. he presenting himself in a kind of a hierarchical way, presenting this Jewish God to others. But others are also saying, who are you, this Jew male Jewish guy? Who do you mm -hmm. think you are? Right. And, 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 and so, for example, in Philemon, I mean, it's such a beautiful and, 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 and extremely well-crafted um, correspondence. Look at of what he's doing. Right, and when you look at Romans, Romans is, is is especially when you look at Romans thirteen. What is it doing? So, so I think that as we talk about Paul within Judaism and going to all of those who are not Jews, and he's presenting themselves a, 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 this Abrahamic narrative, we need to pay attention to the to the the complexities of of sociology of politics of group formation, of group identity. We need right. to pay attention to this. And I'm not saying that I'm, I have done it well here, but I'm, I'm, I'm teasing you and I am appealing to you to actually pay attention to these dimensions because we are talking about blood, um, flesh and blood people, not ideas. Mm -hmm. okay? and the ways in which we see Paul here, he is already constructing a particular thing for us. But we need to go and try to, to, to peel some of these constructions, to peel out some of these constructions and go and, and, and analyze the sociological. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any, any further questions or comments? I can't see anyone's hands um, raised up. Um, Okay, well, I think that will be pretty much it. Well, thank you for that, Ron. That's good. That's bringing a bit of post-colonial and empire studies uh, into this question of Paul within Judaism and what that means and, you know, 
sort of in groups and out groups and, and that kind of thing, which is tremendously relevant to the sort of thing that Paul is uh, doing. Uh, well, in that case, I think we can call it a wrap for today then. Uh, which means we've got one final session left, uh, which will be tomorrow. That'll be with uh, Lynn Kitson and Michael Koch. And then after that, we can hang around a bit further and we can discuss uh, various things um, such as uh, the children of Abraham and uh, also which R words do we, do we like to discuss um, what, what Paul is doing within Judaism, um, retooling, reappropri reappropriation, um, that, that venerable um, line of descriptors we got from uh, Ron today. That'll be something for us to look forward to uh, tomorrow. So uh, until then, I'll bid you all uh, adieu and hope you have a good morning, evening or um, night's rest. So I guess I'll, I'll see you all then. Thank you, Bye, everyone.